I think somebody's knocking at the door. Could you unshare your screen for a moment? So I thought I would invite some friends to come <laughs> visit. Do you know Dan Steinhardt? Well, of course I know Dan Steinhardt. Yeah. Your friend, Dano. Hey, Dano. Dano. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and How are you, Dano? You know, you know Henry then. Wilhelm, correct? Oh, of course. Oh, Henry was a part of this project, yeah. And, hey, and your co-conspirator, Mac Holbert. Oh, that's amazing. Mac is joining. There he is. There he is. So magic. The gang is all together, Stephen. The reason I wanted to, to really dwell on this is uh, I think that uh, for me, and I think for others, including Henry and uh, Mac, I think that America in Detail was a seminal moment when I saw uh, fine art digital prints large and with the kind of detail and clarity that meant uh, chromogenic was gone. <laughs> you know, C prints, uh, the, the uh, prints that you showed in that show, and I saw it live in uh, Chicago and met you and Henry and Dana was there. And I, I walked right up to that first image, the Tuskegee Airman with the flag uh, in his yes. eye, which we'll show in a moment. Uh, and I looked at that and it's like, oh, fuck, that's, everything's different now. This, this same thing happened when I had two images put together by Raphael. Do you remember Raphael, the computer yeah. lady down in Florida? I looked at a transparency of two images of mine and it's like, well, that changes everything. So when you made that show, now talk a little bit about that. And in the meantime, I'm going to actually share my screen because what I happen to have is I happen to have some images that Henry sent me. Here is the America's uh, Epson's oh, America in detail. And this is out of uh, the, uh, um, the book from um, Nash Editions. And Henry is quoted and uh, Wilkes, you're quoted. Uh, and I thought it would be interesting for you guys uh, to briefly talk amongst yourself because I wanted to actually show this is Henry's shot of the uh, installation of the, uh, I think the initial show, right, Henry? In New York City, yeah. I remember that, Henry. Yeah, at Chelsea, the Chelsea uh, markets. That's right. And Henry, in his trusty little camera, Mr. Documenter, carries cameras everywhere. He's like a, um, a uh, kind of a preservationist and conservationist. But I wanted people to be able to see what this show looked like when it was hung. Mm. Because these are really pretty big prints for uh, digital at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, they were... Uh, they were big. I mean, I, that, that's what was so exciting. And uh, who did the scans for you, Stephen? Mac, Mac did the scans and he obviously did all the printing. And I, I, I Mac, it was, uh, we always, we had so much fun uh, doing this. Although I have to say, as he'll remember it too, we both were sort of at a point where um, the initial ink set was getting very challenging in terms of the black point And I remember the day vividly we were um, printing and um, really not, we were, we were just kind of trying to get through. We, we had printed about a third of the show, Mac, would you say, or? Um, well, I, I, I remember it, Stephen. We printed the entire show on the, uh, on that <laughs> There you go, you might've been, it might've yeah. been. It might, maybe, you know, in my mind it was half or something, but whatever, it was a lot. There was a lot, big stack of prints. I remember yeah. that. And then, we got this paper and Mac said, you know, Dano's got this, or I get who, who called you, his markers, Dan. I, so he said, you got, we got this new paper in. It was Greg McCoy. Okay. And, and it was uh, uh, called Premium Luster. And um, you ran the image, you ran the image of uh, the glacier. That was the first one you printed, right? Yeah, but we had to, we got to remember, we had to get the paper from Japan. They had to send a person over to hand carry this paper back. See, I didn't even know those details. Yeah. 
<laughs> All I know is when I saw that paper come off the machine, I started stuttering, blah, 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 black. And I, I got so excited. And we looked at each other and we go, oh, my God, we got to get this paper. We're going to pre-print the whole show. And, yeah. uh, and that's what happened. I mean, it was amazing. So, Stephen, look, look yeah. at that one. You that's an amazing that. picture. Oh, my look God. Can I get a copy? I got to get copies of all of these, Henry. Yeah, we oh, used to be young, didn't we? Oh, my God. I, I had dark hair. Those are the days. Hey, and Jeff, Dano, uh, you looked the same back then. Well, the only observation I can make here, because uh, the images from this show are hanging in uh, Epson's headquarters in Long Beach, California. Those images look exactly the same, but those three people look a little different today. <laughs> So, Hen Henry didn't run an aging test on the people, did he? <laughs> no, he didn't. I think we should have done it. Asked Henry for an aging test. You yeah. know, it's so cool. This is like a reunion, old home week of American detail. Oh, I, it is. I fully agree with what uh, Jeff said that this was a pivotal moment on a number of things all at once. And Stephen, one thing I've always wanted to know that how did you get involved? Did Mark or Danya approach you or did an agency or how did you get into this? It, it was the, uh, the advertising agency. Um, and and uh, I'm just now sk skipping, I'm drawing a blank, but it, it's going to come to me in a moment. Um, it was a creative director at, on the ad side who I had done a, a print ad with. And, um, you know, he, he loved my work and, and, he had, I guess Epson was really, really starting to, you know, the formulate coming out with this new printer that was going to change everything. And he, we were having drinks in Los Angeles and, um, and he, he asked me, he goes, Hey, if you could do anything like anything photographically that you want to do an art show with, um, and you could just go out and photograph it. And this is 1999 now, uh, what would it be? And I like <laughs> having my glass of wine. I'm almost, I almost break the glass because I'm so like, I can't even believe he asked me this question. And I said, wait a second. You know what? Um, you got to let me think about this and, 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 and let me come back to you. And um, Ralph Palamadesi, that's it. Ralph, Ralph Palamadesi. And, um, and Ralph asked me this question and I, I literally was just shaking. I said, let me think about it. Let me come back to you uh, after the weekend. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I, I'm a real student of the history of photography. And so I, I was fascinated by the idea that we were coming into the year 2000. And I wanted the idea of the millennium. And I wanted to see if I could capture America in that moment. Like I, I always loved the, the historical aspect of that. And then I started looking back and I started seeing that it was the advent of color. Color was discovered very almost 100 years earlier. And so all these things kind of were intersecting and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I went across America and we use that as the narrative to tell the story of this new technology to capture America? To me, that's fascinating. So you were partially thinking about the millennia itself. Oh, I was. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Absolutely. And I, and I also felt like I love the idea that this was going to be this historical thing that I knew that I knew that what, what Epson had created, because I was into the technology already. I had seen stuff. And, and, um, and once I told the idea to Ralph, and he ran it up the ladder. It was like, everybody was like, yeah, American detail, let's do it. And then I, I had to come up with, you know, it was 52 days straight on the road. And uh, as Mac knows, Betty called Mac and spoke to Mac on the phone and said, look, Mac, you guys, you guys are going to do this. You guys, we, we love your stuff. And I knew Mac was, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, at National District with Graham, they were, you know, the state of the art in terms of digital printing. And so there was no question I wanted I wanted him all over this. But Betty says to him, you know, there's one thing, and then you've got the job. I need to have a private serenade uh, by Graham of uh, our house. And Mac goes, oh, no problem, no problem. And so uh, everybody, you guys know we're there. We, uh, we're in San Francisco. It's the first time that Gra Graham actually comes to this show. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm with Mac, and we're talking, and Mac disappears. And I see he's fumbling with something. There was a guy playing keyboard and music and stuff. And now Mac is playing with the microphone and like he's, he's setting up the whole thing. And next thing I know, I hear uh, Graham come out and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, I want to dedicate a song to Miss Betty Wilkes. He goes, you <laughs> must really, uh, to allow her husband to go 52 days straight on the road, you must really love his ass. And uh, he played a pretty good version of Our House, right, Mac? Oh, yeah. 
What you said to me, Stephen, it's probably top five. <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty special yeah well the the other interesting thing i i wanted to pull off the the screen share but the other thing that was interesting is that uh one of the things that you guys did was held panel discussions this i think was in new york um where uh, and i see jay there um what's his name from rit there's a there's an Dano, I see your. Oh, there's Dano. Yeah, I see Dano. Yeah. That was my second day with Epson. Was it really, Dano? That's yeah, amazing. I was uh, recruited by this guy on the right, sitting next to Stephen. That's Keith Kratzberg, who's now the CEO of Epson America. And he said, uh, wow. Great. Hey, you know, instead of coming to Long Beach, let's meet in New York. I didn't know anything about this project because I was then with the Eastman Kodak Company if you remember that place. And I sat in the audience and they said, hey, do you know Stephen Wilkes? And I go, yeah, you know. <laughs> I used to call on Stephen when I was a Kodak TSR and you had a place. He, uh, he did, he used to come up to my studio all the yeah, time. Yeah, it was right off uh, Fifth Avenue, wasn't it? Right. Uh, 20, yeah, and and, I, and actually I said, yeah, I used to always have problems with Kodachrome. That's, you know, I'm gonna date myself. <laughs> <laughs> and and actually that, that New York uh, opening was, where I first met Dano. And I was, I knew he had worked for Kodak. And it was like, he, ooh, wow, he's come over from the dark side. This is amazing. Yeah, I should explain <laughs> it. At that moment in time, uh, it, you know, I, I think it's well documented that Henry had recently published a book that uh, did not um, go in Kodak's favor as far as uh, longevity. And if you were a Kodak employee at that time, um, you were not allowed to talk to the man from Iowa. Uh, he was not to be talked to. So my second day of Epson, I, I introduced myself and I said, I can now talk to you. My name is Dan Steiner. <laughs> and Henry said, oh, I know you. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> That's, That's another great picture, Henry. You've got quite, quite an archive there. And well, then we had Carol Kismarek, who's no longer with us. And uh, who was the other curator again? Marvin Heiferman. Marvin, yes, thank you. Thank you, Marvin Heiferman. Was, it's great. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing that you did, Stephen and and um, and Mac, you guys kind of faced a somewhat surly crowd because a lot of photographers didn't like the fact that digital prints look so good, right? Yeah. There was a I remember degree Jay of antagonism. Was, Jay Mazel was there, and he really kind of gave me a a rough time. Do you remember Jay walking up to it? There were people that were, were wearing loops that would literally take their loops out and go oh, yeah. like this on top of the print. Absolutely. I remember Mac and I were going like, are you kidding me? Seriously? <laughs> yeah, there's Jay. <laughs> and that's uh, Bill Dubois in the front. He used yeah, to from, from RIT. Yep. Yeah. I have to tell you this, at that New York opening, um, there were two guys that looked like, you know, from Wall Street or whatever, well-dressed, and they were both looking at, Stephen, at your Field of Dreams picture. And one of them said to the other, he said, and they were up looking close, not with loops, but close. And one of them said to the other, you know, I think that's the most beautiful color photograph I've ever seen. Oh, wow. that's nice. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That really, yeah. that really hit me. Pretty incredible. And certainly the scale of it was part of it, but those were really well done. Sharp. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, Matt, I remember when Mac, we, you worked, we, that print was so incredible, that Field of Dreams print. That first one when it came out was just like... There was something about it. But all of them, you know, they, they, I think when we, we started to, we, as you would step back, it was like, it was almost like the, it was, we were experiencing like, to me, it was like this. And, and I'm sure dye transfer, knowing what dyes used to look like, being able to have that, you know, kind of like depth of color, but the clarity and everything was just so incredible. It was just like, you know. This was back when uh, Mac and, uh, and Graham were working together and the, uh, Great shot. I've got a couple of shots of, this is the two of you working on, that's one of your shots, Steve? That's one of my shots, yeah, that's uh, yeah. from uh, from Harlem, that's the, yeah. uh, one of the Harlem images, yeah. And then the print. Yeah. Was that, and that was also amazing, that? The, the, the neutrality, keeping neutrals in the grayscale like that, remember Mac, that was a real big deal to be able to do that. It was a big deal. 
right? You remember that? We because there was a time we were you were fighting you know against the the whole the metamorism issues that you know things like that were and it was all it just all kind of came together. I remember the first time I had to uh, come head to head with metamorism when I was working. I can't even remember which printer it was, and I was doing a black and white image, and I looked at it and I said, man, this is great. I've finally gotten a nice neutral black and white. And I took the print and to run over to the other studio and I had to go outside to get there. And I went outside and I was holding a green print. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know what the hell was going on. So I immediately called Epson and was uh, informed about metamorism. You showed me that. I remember you took me through, you showed me that. And I, I remember you said it was like the green flash and it was. Okay, but technically speaking, just to point out, it really wasn't metamorism. Metamorism is a good thing. It was a metameric failure. It was the failure of an ink to reflect the same light under tungsten and daylight, correct, Henry? That's yes. correct. Yeah, and in fact, the, the, the ink set that, that Stephen Neer Show was printed on was known as the archival ink set, and that had an extremely stable yellow but a yellow that was not very good in other respects, including, as you just said, uh, metameric failure. So what Epson did the next step was to introduce a new yellow, and that was made its first appearance with the ultra chrome ink set, and then added the gray. And uh, at that point, things really got pretty good. But but Mac, I was so impressed with how well you did printing that show, and you knew it was going to be viewed under tungsten, so you could sort of count on that. Uh, but that was the start. It was the, I mean, the shift, that, that was the first show in the world of any size at all that was printed with pigments instead of dyes. And particularly displacing, you know, chromogenic papers like a Kodak Endura or Fuji Crystal Archive, that current Epson prints like True Color P, P7000, et cetera, um, those are anywhere from 12 to 15 times longer lasting than current Kodak or Fuji silver halide papers. In fact, the, the Kodak and Fuji papers are arguably the worst product on the market right now. It's sort of the tail end of that era. But this show would really introduce it, and that, that piece... Uh, Jeff, we were talking about this earlier, that Vicki Goldberg wrote in the New York Times, uh, talked about that. It was, and this was a, a landmark thing in many, many respects, and that was one of them. A lot of us forget uh, that back in that era, of course, digital cameras hadn't arrived yet, really. So another crucial part was the scanning of the transparency or negative. And Mac, what you brought to the table that was a crucial component in which you were highly skilled. It's not like today's scanners and software. This was all all strange stuff back then. Photos. Well, yeah, you, he had the, the the ability to scan at a resolution. I remember the flat. You had that flatbed scanner, yeah. Mac, yeah. and you would. What he had this whole way he would do it, where you know it was a liquid and it would you know float, and it was kind of an amazing thing. The scans were. I mean, that was. You're right. That's a really good point, Henry, because. Scanning was not uh, an art form at that point, really. And it was not easy to get really great quality scans by any means. Well, so. That was Jeff, Jeff Kern's scanner, right? Uh, Stephen, what I was going to say is that I, uh, we've been talking about these images. I think now is we should actually see them. Yeah, I think so. so. That'd be good. Yeah, and, and Dan, Henry, and, and Mac, you guys can stay and watch the show if you want, or you can uh, bug out either way. But... I wanted to personally extend my appreciation and thanks for showing up. And Dano, have you been playing a lot of golf? I was going to say, you're looking mighty tan. It could be the uh, Kelvin on my uh, new uh, one by two here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. That's well, even it's more looks, tan, do you think? Yeah. <laughs> your, your basement changes every time we talk. You're, it's getting better and better. <laughs> so, but I just wanted to thank you guys and, and hang for the show if you want, but Steven, uh, let's go ahead and, and go through the uh, yeah. American let's we'll do that. And guys, it's so great to see everybody. Thank you for surprising me this way. This is wonderful. Yeah, it's a great reunion. So it's great to see everybody. Good to see you guys. Thank you again.
And Henry, those pictures, oh my God, fantastic. I'm going to hang around for the show. Good, good. Please do. I hope you all do. It'd be great. America in detail. You know, the, like I spoke, you know, the idea was to capture America uh, in 52 days straight. And, and so what we ended up doing was we looked across the country and I looked at a map and it was almost like I made nodal points to try to, if I had 52 days, could I go to certain places? And at the end of this whole experience, would you be able to actually have a feeling for the what the country is experiencing in this moment in time. So we started looking at all kinds of events. One of the big ones was uh, we wanted to shoot Memorial Day. And uh, I had heard about the, the Tuskegee Airmen uh, and they had this amazing history. And, um, and so we went to actually, we were able to go down on Memorial Day and photograph them and their very famous airfield where they all flew out of. Um, and, and this was a treat. And this was one of the airmen, um, I was doing a group portrait of all of them, and uh, uh, it was a, over 95 degrees. It was an incredibly hot, uncomfortable day. And um, as he walked outside and sat down, I noticed um, the American flag was reflecting in his eyes. And so I was able to um, uh, do this photograph of him. Uh, Ali Peak is his name, and Ali was just an amazing guy. And you could just feel the pride in his eyes. Uh, Went to Iowa and was able to photograph the group, uh, this family farm. And so I just got them all to pose. And then the dog literally jumped into the picture and was hanging out in the background like that. Uh, and I've always, uh, one of the great joys about this work was somebody walked up to me, she was, Stephen Wilkes, are you from Iowa? And I go, no. She goes, boy, did you get Iowa? You know, uh, and that's always the best when, when somebody looks at a photograph from a place and you got it. Um, this is uh, this is also in Iowa. This is during a Fourth of July parade, and uh, Mac probably remembers this story. Uh, this I was using actually a Spiritone adapter that um, um, was used in the 1950s, and it enabled me to actually um, look one way, and I'd be photographing somewhere else. And so it was like a uh, <laughs> it was a little spy <laughs> adapter. Oh yeah, I had it modified to a, a contacts, a six four five contacts, and so. This kid never knew I took this picture. And uh, I remember when I made the photograph, I was so excited that I got the picture that I never got the model release. And so long story short, every one of the images that are used in here, we have a release on. So I actually had somebody go out. I had a picture of him without eating this uh, and find this kid. And they found him in Garnavillo. And, uh, and he was, he was, very excited for the picture that he was going to be a part of it. And he signed the model release and thank God I was able to use this photograph because it's truly one of my favorites. It's, it reminded me it's something I would have been doing, but I probably would have been in my, at my house in my, in my room somewhere trying to eat this before my mother came home. <laughs> that was a great little adapter Spiritone had. God, I wonder what ever happened to Spiritone. Wow. You know, who used it a lot was, uh, um, Helen Levitt. Helen Levitt. Thank you, Lord Henry. Perfect. Helen Levitt actually worked with that a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's how I heard about it first. And then I found one used, and then I actually had it modified so I could fit it into a, 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 a Zeiss lens for the uh, 645. So one of the things we did with all this work was, you know, it was important to shoot large format because I knew if I could give Mac really great negatives and scanning that we'd get image, you know, it would really elevate the prints too. You know, the more detail I had, the better. Um, this was a course at, um, in Wyoming. We went to Virginia and uh, actually went down into a coal mine. Uh, and this is the group of guys I went down with. This is something that's always important. They, they always check their light before they go down. That's pre-LED. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then just moments, you know, a lot of what we would do is I would go to certain areas and then we just react to what was going on. Um, this was a, another 4th of July moment. Um, this was in uh, uh, outside of Alabama. Uh, we drove up. I saw the house, uh, knocked on the door, and she came out. And it was just like she was dressed like this. It was unbelievable. And I just uh, we had this lovely conversation. She said, "Sure, I'll pose for you." And uh, did this portrait. Same thing. These guys were uh, they were all swimming in a uh, in a river, and um, they came out, and they you could actually see the bumps. Uh, on their skin um, and, 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 you know, the, the, from just coming out of the water. And these are two identical twins that I photographed in, uh, in Miami. They're both artists. New York City. Uh, this is a guy who sweeps up 
Grand Central Station that nobody ever knows about. And, you know, one of the things that's so fun, I think, about photography is that I think for me, I always look at the idea that uh, if you pay attention and you stay open, things will come into your orbit. And for me, when I made this photograph, I had the composition, everything was great, but it just wasn't happening. And all of a sudden, I turned around and this guy was sweeping behind me. And I looked at him and I go, oh my God, I, that's it, that's the picture. And so I had to get his permission. He didn't speak English and we had his uh, supervisor, we had to speak to them and he finally uh, you know, said, yes, you can take his photograph. And so I did this portrait. It's always been one of my favorites from the series. So you, you had to actually get model releases for all these people as you shot Every them. single one, yeah. And that's a hard thing to do, you know, when you shoot, mm -hmm. you know, street yep. style. You know, uh, you got a running gun and, but you, you know, so like I made this picture, this was in Cape Cod. Oh, what eyes. Mm. And then this girl, I, I, Walker Evans, I, I'm a huge fan of Walker Evans. And um, one of the things that, um, that we spoke about with the project, uh, with Ralph and, 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 uh, and the whole team at Epson, was this idea, and Mac and I had in-depth conversations about how could we uh, use this technology and using digital, once we translated the film into digital, could we do certain things manipulation-wise that would make it feel turn of the century? That was, this didn't happen on this particular image, but I was thinking about Walker Evans when I made this photograph, and I, and I went to Harlem, and I found this wall that really looked like something Evans would have photographed, and it had the words, think positive. And then this woman walks by and she's got a scar on her knee and the whole thing. And, and I asked her, would, would you pose, would allow me to do a portrait of you? And that's what I did. Um, but that idea of exploring um, technology and changing, almost using the state-of-the-art printing process and then making it look like a turn-of-the-century print. You know, that image uh, in Harlem? Yes. That, that's on the floor where my office currently is. And when I walk by that thing, I got to tell you, I just want to pull that carrot out of her back. You want to pull that carrot out of her back? Yeah, there you go. Well, then, then I did my job, if you still feel that way. I used, so this is, uh, I used uh, color negative. Um, and it was um, the, the Kodak color negative film. Um, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Was it Varicolor? Yeah, it was Varicolor. That, not Varicolor, no, it was the other one, the, the slightly newer version of that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did uh, also uh, Velvia. Yeah, Fuji Velvia. Most of, most of it was on Velvia. So I worked with a two and a quarter. Um, I was with a six, four, five contacts, which I used like a 35 millimeter almost. And then I worked with a large four by five camera. So those are the two things. These guys, um, we saw them uh, one afternoon. Uh, I saw them pulling in. And I asked them, would you guys come back uh, for me to photograph you? And they came back the next night. I never thought they'd show up. And they showed up. And um, this was a tough picture. To, you know, I'm not anchoring them or anything. That's, you know, like a, a several second exposure um, of them. Uh, and, and what they're doing is uh, they're, they're uh, bow fishing. So they use the lights to draw the fish towards them. Uh, this was on top of... Um, the, the, the same roof that you see the ball, they used to have a cup of soup there and it throws steam up in the air at night on Times Square. So I had this idea, I'd love to see the steam, see Times Square through the steam. And you know, Stephen, on this image, uh, on my second day with Epson, when I saw this, I, I knew I made the right decision about leaving uh, Kodak because the detail where you could see people having meetings in yeah. office buildings, <laughs> was just shocking. You'd never see that level of detail before in any C print. No, nothing. You'd never get that. It, you, it just doesn't hold up when you get close to it. That's what was so revelatory. When I, when I remember seeing the prints, suddenly, not only was large format uh, giving me this ability to, to suddenly have things that were significant, uh, or insignificant, I should say, become significant, but the print was delivering on that for the first time. And that's something that never happened before. So for me as an artist, I started started to think differently because I could see that kind of detail. How much further could I go? You know, what where are, what other stories are there that I could tell? We all had this feeling of a of a giant contact print when you, and you'd walk up and look at different parts of it as opposed, you know, to the traditional eight by ten or eleven fourteen print. Oh yeah, totally. And and just the 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 range, you know, the highlight shadows, uh, everything was just uh, it was just different. It, it it seemed to me when I first started looking at those prints that the, the idea of compromise was 
where we always looked at, well, this is my negative, then I got to like, you know, the print is the print. And yes, they are different. But it seemed to me that with the, uh, with the, with the Epsons, it was, um, it, we had so much control that you could optimize it to exactly what's in your mind, as opposed to like what the paper delivered on. Stephen, the thing you told me was that when Mac had really first done the show and you saw a bunch of the prints that was on a, uh, a matte paper or a paper that was not um, giving you the dynamic range that, that the luster gave. It was the enhanced matte paper. Yeah. I always liked that name enhanced matte because if you've got to call something enhanced, it ain't. <laughs> Well, yeah. But no, I mean, it's fine for like watercolor type of look. Exactly. But you want a graphic dynamic. Uh, you got to have black if you want color. That's the yeah. bottom line. And, and Stephen said that uh, he was like really depressed because he thought the show was going to look like shit because the prints didn't look very good. I was clinically depressed. I mean, I really was. You, you guys got so happy when you saw the Epson uh, uh, premium luster. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. It was, we both were just about jumping out of our seats because we both were, look, it's, it's the kind of thing, to be frank with you, it's like anything. If you are swimming in a pool and it's uh, not very clean, but it's a 95 degree day every day and, you know, you have a pool. So you start swimming and after a while, it's not so bad. It's, you, know, you close your mouth, you don't open your eyes. It's okay. We were kind of swimming with it for like three months or whatever it was and, or two months. And, you know, we were both kind of numb at that point. And that's when that paper came in. All of a sudden it was like, we saw again. It was like, cause we, I don't think, I don't you, about you, Mac, but I, I think you start to acquiesce to when you when you have a what you think is black and you don't see a real black against that you kind of just assume that's black and and I think when we both looked at that print come off and we saw a real black for the first time it was just game changer yeah I mean I it was I think it was um, the most important thing I think from from our experience and I, I don't want to talk for Mac but from my pre experience for sure that was the game changer. When we had that, that suddenly brought that ink set to life in a way that nothing else had. Yeah. Uh, so this, I was storm chasing uh, in North Dakota. Yeah. And imagine is, that image with uh, with like gray blacks as opposed to black blacks. Exactly. It, yeah. This would not work. Does not work, and and that's what was happening. And we, you know, we, I kept looking at the image, going, "Well, wait a second. The blue isn't there. Like the the the, the black, like you described, Mac. The black in the veins that you see in the in the glacier, uh, it just doesn't it doesn't exist. It's it's like a D Max. You know, it looks look chalky. And um, uh, and when this came off, this is the this was the print that we saw that we just realized, oh my God, everything is it, everything's changing now. This is it. Uh, Napa Valley, same thing, like holding the detail, the shadow information in these pictures. I mean, uh, uh, with conventional print processes, it would be like, you know, I, I don't know how you do it, like dodging and burning. Well, you'd have to do uh, masking. You'd have yeah. to do contrast, contrast masking. masking yeah. Totally. Yeah. You, could never re you could never render it. And the, and the gradient, I remember when Mac printed this, that, that we had this amazing gradient in the sky. You know, you could almost feel the light coming through it. And I have to tell you a story that <clears throat> once I was visiting uh, uh, Epson in Japan and talking to one of their engineers, and he was really tuned in to gradients into the highlights, and he had a big print. It was a photograph of a Harley Davidson motorcycle gas tank, very high gloss, and had specular reflections on it. And he was obsessed with that transition, just like that sky in your picture and really wanted to perfect that. And when I saw that and had this discussion with them, I realized that they were on the, in a totally different world than photography as we'd known it. That's a conversation that not a very, very many people are really gonna have, you know, uh, unless you're obsessed with, you know, that kind of thing and, and, and highlights and stuff. And again, again, I think a lot of photography, uh, for the most part, even down to, I would say this about my work, is like where you look at, traditional photography has always been defined by frame size and uh you know in this work we were still working in four by five two and a quarter and that way the lens sees those things uh and so we always photographers in general would always you know adapt and accept 
whatever those things were based on, because that's just the way it was, right? That was as good as it could get. And I think this was the beginning of where everything changed, where suddenly your mind's eye could really begin to articulate uh, what's, what's in your head onto a print, you know? And, and I think digital has been, uh, for me, that kind of an explosion where it's, I don't, I, I, there are no limitations anymore to what I want to see or, 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 what, or what story I want to tell or how I'm going to tell it, really. And that's one of the reasons that I thought it was so important to kind of revisit this show, Stephen, because you get a lot of credit, uh, but sometimes um, it's the credit you don't realize that really uh, is the most rewarding. Because I think 20 years ago, if you think back, and, and I got into digital in the 90s, and, uh, you know, in search of a hard print was a hard thing to do. And then right. when, when the 9500 and then subsequent printers came out, because in many respects, and Kevin and I have talked about this, a transparency, well, okay, if you're Jay Maisel uh, projecting a slide, is the ultimate photograph. But for most people looking in a photographic print, that's an actual photograph. A digital file or a negative or a transparency, you know, that's the medium, that's the original, but that's not really the photograph. The photograph is the print. And that's why I think your prints and w whether you meant this or not, I I know what you were doing. You were just trying to get the damn thing done and look as good as you possibly could make it and then, you know, move on to the next project. But that's why I want to come back and look back at it 20 years later because you made a big impact. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, it was, listen, I, I took it seriously. Um, you know, I, I felt like I was documenting history and I, I felt like, um, you know, I think even in that, that there, there may be a quote there. I remember when I, I spoke about this project and what it meant to me, um, I, I had found uh, some uh, words and it was, it was actually uh, somebody had spoken about the advent of color. When co color photography was invented, uh, you could literally change the word color and use digital. And it was as if you were speaking in the same time period. So there was this, res there was, there was this sort of um, fundamental, like, disbelief that color was real, that it was fake, that it wasn't a real photograph, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I think when people first heard about this and that it was digital and that what is that, you know, is it a real print? Is it an op, you know, all that stuff. People got very hung up on the same kinds of things. And I remember, and, and I know Mac experienced this a lot too, I'm sure. And that was, there was this sense of, you know, well, if you're, if you're a uh, you know, a real photographer, you shoot film, you know, if you're not, you know, then you don't, you know, there, there was a certain, um, uh, it, it was really like a, a rub uh, in terms of if you embrace the digital thing. Uh, and, and I think most people just didn't understand it, to be frank. And like anything foreign, it becomes somewhat, you know, I don't, I don't want to do that. It's that, that, that doesn't, you know, but then as people slowly got to see it, and begin to look at what was going on. And I think for this work and for this project, the fact that it was done from film originally and then it was made into prints um, was a great bridge. I think, you know, had it been digital camera with digital prints, it might have been a little overwhelming or might have been a little too much. But so I think it was a blessing in a way that digital capture wasn't there at that time. In 2000, there was no capture devices to do this. And actually, Stephen, your point about prints is really good because one thing that has not changed really at all, certainly in the art world, that the print is still what is bought, what is sold, what is signed. And just like your day-night work, uh, you're yeah. selling prints of that. And it's certainly in the fine art gallery world, that aspect of it has not really changed at all. The technology has no. changed, but not the commerce. No, the, the issue thing is, to be frank, Henry, with, with digital, I look at the print as the original now. I don't, I don't even, you know, to me, the, the, it's, it's all about the print. I don't want to, I'm not, you know, I, I, as much as I can show you these on the screen, but to me, the, the experience of a print on the wall, that's really what it's about for me. And I think that as because we get, you know, it's so easy to replicate this stuff now to copy over files and, you know, multiply these things, you know, where the old days, it was just you shot on film and you had one you know, original, and you got a scan of that if you were lucky, and the, you know, but you still, this, the original was sacred. We, we don't have that anymore. So in a way, the print becomes that for me. It's like, you know, um, and especially, 
you know, we, we, you do, you know, I do a, a limited edition thing. So I'm, I don't make a lot of prints uh, of, of a single photograph. Um, I, I wanted to talk about this one because Mac, this was one we really, um, really had fun exploring together. Mac had a collection of autochromes and Mac and I had this conversation and I said, you know, Mac, I'm wondering, do you think we could make one of my photographs look like an autochrome? And we started having this conversation. He says, you know, Stephen, I've got this collection. I could scan one and we could, I could see if we could uh, lay it, uh, lay the actual grain structure over the image. And that's what he did. You know, we, he scanned an original autochrome and then we looked at it and we saw, you know, how it, it and this was the image that we did it on. And, and it's it just, it worked beautifully. And, um, you know, I, I've been, ever since that experience, Mac, I'm obsessed with autochromes. I mean, I just love those things. I, Potato starch. Potato starch, yeah, I know. The, the other problem about it is though, Mac, some of the dyes that were used in the original process, the, the, the actual yeah. plants that created the dyes are extinct now which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a magical process, but I thought this was kind of a, a really exciting thing, which I think also was, I think if you think about when we did this, it was really radical because nobody was doing stuff like this, right? You were, we were taking this idea of, 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 of a conventional photograph and then inter, interjecting, uh, like taking a, an actual vintage piece of photographic material and then Mac overlaying it onto it and then creating a print that now has this look like it's, you know, a, an actual print from an autochrome. So that was kind of an exciting also next step. And that for me started to make me think like, God, can you imagine what all the possibilities could be with this medium, uh, this new uh, digital printing medium? You know, as an observation, Stephen, I have to say these all look really good 20 years later. 20 years later, right? Yeah, yeah. and I'm, I'm trying, I was thinking about, well, I could do a little tweak here and a little tweak there, but not much. No, no, not much. They're, they're really there. I mean, it's, uh, you know, um, this was, uh, again, you know, on the road. Uh, so, you know, I, I, would, I would just, I was constantly shooting through the whole experience. And it was interesting um, when, when Carol and, and Marvin Heiferman, uh, Carol Kismeric, they were the curators. That was an interesting thing, seeing what their perception of what the, the, the selection was going to be. Um, that was kind of an interesting thing. I think uh, I think I said to you, Mac, uh, you know, geez, I don't know. I'm, this whole curation thing is kind of strange. Normally they curate when you're dead, right? <laughs> it's not when you're alive, <laughs> you know. So it was a, it was a strange uh, experience for me because uh, I had certain pictures I was very attached to. But in the end, I really think their their selection held up over time. Cape Cod. Uh, this was uh, in Harlem, empty swimming pool. And you saw that early picture of mine. I, I really connect those two pictures. So the first picture I say I felt myself in, I'm on the inside looking out. I'm on the outside now looking in. And I, I feel like that's a kind of con a connection to the way I look at things now. So this was, uh, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal about a guy named Gary Greff who um, uh, lives in uh, this small town of, um, of uh, between North and South Dakota, and it's called the Enchanted Highway. And um, they built a super highway, and nobody goes through his town anymore. So he started creating these giant sculptures to, you know, like basically like the Field of Dreams, build it and they will come. And I read about it. And I thought it looked, sounded such an incredible thing, what he was doing. I had to go there. And so when I pulled up, that's his nephew uh, mowing the lawn under one of his giant grasshoppers that he built. And then I was in uh, Chicago during Mayfly season, and that's a <laughs> billboard with Mayflies covering it. <laughs> Not very appetizing, but. And of course, this is a uh, uh, Mojave Desert in the South. I was thinking about Walker Evans when I when I made this picture. And then the Field of Dreams. Uh, this picture almost really didn't happen. We got there and it was an ugly, gray, almost a rainy afternoon all day. We had one day there. Um, and I finally got permission by, the field is owned by uh, people on the right side. Uh, the, from center field all the way across to the house is owned by one family. And the uh, left field center and left is owned by another farmer. And they, it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys and they don't get along. And so my production person got me permission and all of a sudden I see what's happening. I'm thinking, Oh my God, I, I sense the sky's going to open. And I asked her, do you think you could turn the lights on? She goes, I haven't done it in six years. I don't know if they work. She turns the lights on, they go on. All of a sudden I start getting this fog bank rolls in 
and I'm thinking, yeah, oh my God, this is like the movie. It's, it's going to happen. It's happening. The sky starts getting this incredible pink color and I'm shooting. I'm on top of my van with a four by five camera making this picture. And all of a sudden my producer runs over to him and she goes, listen, can I just ask you something? Are, are you getting the sunset in the picture? I go, of course I'm getting the sunset in the picture. What do you think? Of course I'm getting it. She goes, well, we don't have permission from the sunset. You can shoot everything from the right, uh, from second base to the right, but the left field, we don't have permission for. I go, well, you better get permission for left field because left field's definitely in my picture. <laughs> you know, so that is exactly what happened. And she finally got permission. And, uh, and so thank God I was able to, you know, work it all out. But it was an extraordinary experience doing Well, that's a fascinating story. I didn't know that at all. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it literally opened up one day, the fog came. And by the way, the woman who owned the field, the right side of the field in the house, she looked at me, she goes, you know what? She goes, you're one lucky guy. I go, really? She goes, do you know they spent 30 days filming here and out of the 30 days, they only had one day where they got the fog. And it, the director and all the crew loved it so much that if you watch the movie closely, it doesn't match any of the other footage. When you see the fog in the film, nothing matches. But they kept it in the film because it was so extraordinary. She goes, you got the fog the one night you're here. <laughs> so I was like, this, this is the image that I mentioned earlier where a gentleman said, this is the most beautiful color photograph I've ever seen. Oh, that's a, quite a compliment. After I took this picture, we all ran out on the field and we had a catch and we were playing, you know, fungo and it was kind of magical. I got to be honest, it was, uh, it's just one of the coolest places ever. And um, it just has this surreal quality to it. And uh, uh, so, um, you know, to be there and to, to have that experience and uh, it was, uh, it was special. Well, you must have an angel that follows you around. I mean, it's just like... Well, it's funny. My, my assistants think I have a halo. My assistants always tease me. They go, it's got the Wilkes halo going, you know. <laughs> I, I, I stay positive, to be frank with you. I, I think I, 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 um, I try to stay around positive people. And then when, you know, I, I don't allow a lot of negative things to come into my orbit. And I find that if I just stay that way, you know, um, sometimes things positive things come into your orbit. Things that you don't expect sometimes happen to you. Given the lighting of the, the field itself, the light on the house on the right is extraordinary. Oh yeah, it's just, you know, you're just getting, a, it's, a, it's a really, it's, you know, this kind of light happens for about, uh, about 30 seconds where you get that window and that's it, you know. So if you don't get it, you know, you, if you're busy thumpering with the shutter or you can't load the back in time, you miss it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole ratio thing. And, um, you know, I just was lucky to catch it. I really was. I was just lucky it opened for me because we, we weren't staying the extra day we had one day there and that was it. And, um, and, and it worked out. So it was, uh, it was a special, special moment. And still one of my favorites, all time favorites from the, from the series.